the minute that God called on you, the minute that God's word, his call, made you make an about face, at that moment, for you simply trusting God, you're a saint. You're a saint. <laughs>
because the exact, as I'm going to try and show you today, the exact idea, especially when we're dealing with Hebrew, is because of the language, is ambiguous and vague. However, there are concepts provided for us in the Bible, in the Old Testament, because that's where I'm looking first, that actually drive home a point which is so far removed from the idea of perfection. That's the other thing. By the third and fourth centuries, holiness became equated with perfection. Again, it's another part of a language problem. When Jesus is on the cross and he says, the last words he says are, tetelestai, it is finished. That word, tetelestai, is a verb, but it means to bring to completion or to finish. And we know that the concept of being perfected or completed does not happen here. It's begun here. It started, my faith has started the process, but it's not finished here. So anybody who brings about the idea that perfection and holiness are synonymous, you're, again, you're very far off the mark. Now, somebody may say, well, what about when God says he's holy? There is where I said to you, and I think I touched on this last week, what what and who God is as an attribute, a dimension of God, we may be partakers of that dimension by virtue of God granting or giving to us the Spirit. But void of that, apart from that, we don't have the capacity. So when we read about God's command to tell, the, he says to the people, be holy, I am holy one must understand the difference between when God says something and he is, and he does not have to become that because he is, versus speaking to us who are not. And if there is something that must become of us, it must come from him to us to become that. But unlike God, whose quality or whose when we're talking about the attributes of God, those attributes do not change. The qualities we receive from God, remember Galatians 5 talks about that which we receive from the Spirit. But it is gifts, we'll, call it, we'll say it this way, it is gifts given in part. It's a deposit. It is not the full thing. So I ask you, I'm asking you, and it's a rhetorical question, but I'm asking you this question. If we only receive something in part, how can people walk around and say they've received whatever it is and they are complete and full, except that they be full of something else? <laughs> and I, I, I mean, I'm not trying to be blasphemous. I'm saying to you what has happened in my lifetime, specifically from studying this book, is I've realized that there are a lot of people out there with bad theology that have basically tried to push me, suppress me, down into a region of I haven't obtained what they have. They have it. I don't. That's never going to be in the language of God. God says, basically, if, if God's the one speaking, and through his book, he's the one speaking, whether he speaks directly or he speaks to inspire the writers, he's the one that decides. So the initiative always is going to start with God. And anybody who wants to make crazy statements, and they are crazy, about sanctification or holiness, and a whole movement, by the way, um, Again, while, while I'm on this subject, this will be a good time to introduce, not today, but in part somewhere in, in one of these messages, to tell you about certain movements that took place, movements that probably, no, not probably, started in Europe, and when they, when they came here were known under another name. Um, let's just take the Quakers, for example. The Quakers in American... Um, in the history of Christianity in America. Their take on holiness and the holiness movement through the Quakers basically caused 
a whole group of people to essentially disappear, to be non-existent, because they took the idea or the concept to abstain from certain things to such an extreme that they basically made sure to eradicate themselves. That's holiness unto the Lord for you. So, um, as I said, along with translation and transmission of the Bible, the wonderful gift of spreading the word, there's also this other bad thing that comes with it, which is the trouble of trying to convey ideas into our watered down, homogenized tongue, as opposed to what, what these words meant in their setting from a more original uh, point of view. And this is where the trouble begins because no one really is quite agreed on how we should tackle this word. The one thing I, I'm going to do today, and it's maybe torture for some of you, but I'm going to do it, is to show you our Hebrew word, which I tried to go through briefly last week. I did a little bit of on festival. I'm going to show you what happens to the Hebrew word holy as it is going through the verbal system to kind of give you an idea of how, if we were just doing um, a form, let's say, to conjugate verbs, how this word will change. Don't go, oh, no. History and grammar are two things most people hate. So what we have, I'm going to show you from my tablet here. We might as well just roll up our sleeves and get into it. Don't worry about trying to take this all in. I recognize that there are, I've got people listening to me this morning who are listening to the service and probably at work. <laughs> so you can't take notes or write stuff down. Uh, but this service will replay, and I'm sure that someone on my staff will be kind enough to um, make a better printed, legible uh, chart of what I'm doing here. So let's take a look at this, and I'll use blue as my color here. So here's our word, our Hebrew word. And here we can see we've got the word, this is our E sound, so we've got Kadesh or Kadesh. And this is, we're going through what the Hebrew calls binyam or constructing from this here are three consonants in Hebrew, and that's the way the verb system works for the most part. Consonants and the vowels are added to help us. So the perfect in the Hebrew, which is, could be simple past or it could be the present, simply he sanctified. Now don't, don't listen to this and then go, but you said that means he sanctified because you're going to find in certain settings the perfect will be in a verb form holy. I don't know how they did this, but that's why I told you it's very confusing. We're going to try and straighten this out. In the imperfect, which could be future, continuous or repeated action, or modal. A modal is shall, will, might, may. That's what modal is, like he may sanctify or he might sanctify. Continuous or repeated, that is, it, it is initiated and it, it repeats itself or future, something that is yet to happen. But I want you to take a look. Just initially here, you can see what's different. That's different right there. Even if you don't read Hebrew, you can definitely tell that's different. And then take a look right here underneath the kof. See, there's a line there as opposed to there being a dot. That changes the value of the word. So here, in the imperfect, he will sanctify. He will be or he will, or he might, or he may. That would be your modal. Um, the preterite, plus vav consecutive, all that means is this letter right here is and, and, he, ye, and then we have here, so and he sanctified in the preterite with vav consecutive. In the jessive here, again, something a little bit different. This is a yod. I did it for emphasis so it's thick that way. Take a look at what we have that may be slightly different, but some of these will be spelt the same. That's just the way it is. Let him sanctify. 
cohortative, which is I will sanctify, and you can see there what looks different on this form. Let's go to the next page. All right, imperative. Here we have Kadesh, sanctify. When the Lord says sanctify the people, there is an imperative. It's a command to do something. And most of these um, imperative commands, sanctify, are coming from the boss himself. It's not somebody else. Maybe God is talking to Moses and he says, Moses, sanctify the people. But Moses doesn't have the sanctifying power. He's got the word of God that sends that. Basically, they may have to go through the steps that God orders. The steps may be in one case to anoint with oil, in another case to wash with water, in another case to sprinkle with blood. But all the while, it is the sanctifier who gives the orders to sanctify. And this is where we might do well in some of these to get into those verses, to really peel them open and to see maybe we've been reading them not quite exactly the way we ought to. Because I think a lot of people say, sanctify, sanctify yourself. What do I have to do to sanctify myself? Oh boy, right? Okay, the participle, which is kind of easy to identify. It's got that mem at the front. The sanctifying one, or the one who sanctifies. That's your participle. Infinite construct, to sanctify, with the lamed in front. Infinite absolute. You can see all of these look just slightly different. Here's a, it emphasizes the, the verb form of, let's say, in the absolute, what would be between absolute and construct. I'm not giving an example because we'll ha we will have some examples. But uh, if you remember, if you did Hebrew with me, in the construct, it's always the second. You've got the word next to it. In the absolute, it will be the last word. Um, then I tried to hurry up here and write two uh, different verb groups here, the hiphal and the hithpale. The hithpale, which is that reflexive form. And the hiphal will be causative. To cause someone to be holy would be putting the word sanctify or holy in the hiphal to cause someone to become holy. God caused someone to become holy by declaring a thing holy. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of why when we come back into the English, and you notice that most of the verb forms here that I have chosen have to do with sanctify, sanctifying, the one sanctifying. And I said to you, there are some verb forms which make no sense to me as holy as a verb, which I'm still not sure I can wrap my mind around because that would either be a noun or an adjective, but somewhere you'll find three examples, I know, that really we should be translating something as becoming holy, something that is declared or becoming holy. That would obviously be a hiffle um, verb. So that gives you an idea that when I talk about holiness, holy, sanctifying, sanctification. I'm not asking you to learn the verbs. I'm asking you to take a look. If you only looked at, just look at the English portion of this. Let's go back for a second. Let's look at the English, just that, which I think can kind of help. He sanctified, he will sanctify. Easier looking at the English, isn't it? And he sanctified, let him sanctify. I will sanctify. Sanctify as a command, the one sanctifying as an act or an action, which would be a participle, to sanctify. And we would, we would say here in the causative, to make or to cause to become holy or to make or to cause to become set apart or sanctified. And in the reflexive, in English, we have to add yourself, themselves, so when it says sanctify yourselves, we're dealing with a reflexive verb. Now, I know you didn't come to church to learn grammar, but what I'm trying to show you is without having to learn all this, you can see that we're, we're trying to tackle figuring out one word, which a better way to explain in the Hebrew would be to say, let's just say that sanctify, the word sanctify, 
is the color red and take it through shades of a color red that will give you shades of the meaning of a word that will not necessarily change the entire meaning of the word, but the verbal time tenses conjugation will give us clarity. So that's the first thing I wanted to show you. And um, why does this be become important? I will tell you why. Because this is where language gives us the insight. Now, from our, this is um, Dictionary of Old Testament Theology and Exegesis, Volume 3, Willem A. Van Gemeren, General Editor. Um, there are some interesting, and by the way, if you're wondering, there were a couple of verb forms missing here. Um, if I were to write them all and write the whole paradigm for you, you, you get the gist of it, though. Um, let me read a few things out of this to give you some insight into our uh, Hebrew words. So first, um, what this dictionary points out, you must distinguish between the holy and the common, between the unclean and the clean. I want you to kind of hold your brain for a second, hold the stuff that I'm putting out there. If the initial meaning of our word holy, holiness, sanctify, sanctification, has more to do with um, concepts, think of that which has been devoted versus that which is secular, that which is profane versus that which is dedicated. This is why to make this a simply a moral concept or an ethical concept basically takes God out of the equation completely. Now, thank God God is who he is. He's all power. He's love. He's all these things. But let's not get confused about the, the essence of this word when we're talking about this. And what I love about what's just said here very succinctly from this dictionary, they're using um, a passage both from Exodus and um, Leviticus. And the suggestion here is that we, we, we need to be looking more at the antonyms to better understand the word than trying to find synonyms or things that will click in our brain of how we should understand the word. So if we're going to go with profane, because most of the dictionaries and lexicons say holiness, you're either going to have unholy or unclean or profane. You'll have consecration, you'll have desecration. Sometimes going to the antonym is what helps us. And um, certainly, and let me just kind of pick up here, it says, each leg of the parallelism contains an opposed pair, namely holy and common or profane on the one side, clean or unclean on the other side. Thus, common or profane is the uh, technical antonym. Now, instead of making this perfection, cleanliness, purity, and I'm not saying that, again, remember, we have some vague definitions, but instead of making this word that, what happens if we take the word profane for a minute? Let's pick this apart. So I introduced this last week. Profane, our English word profane, comes from profanus, which is pro, outside, Phanus, which was the word for temple. Outside the temple is profane. We have defined this word out of Hebrews. Be not like that profane person Esau, saying, not discerning spiritual things. So we can simply say common, something that has become common, something that is not being recognized as. Now go back to some of the concepts that we will encounter. And over and over again, you'll hear God say that he wants the people to keep his name holy. And that's not only in the Old Testament, that's in the New Testament, right? Hallowed be thy name, holy. And why is it that over and over again, we're told to not 
profane God's name. That would simply, that would be not recognizing who God is, treating God and God's things as common, not discerning the spiritual nature of the things of God. I used God's name, so let's stay in that, in that area. Why is there such an admonition? In fact, through and through, as you begin to look, you'll find that there are concepts surrounding the word holy being used as I go back to, for example, God's name. And over and over, God says, don't profane my name. Keep my name holy. Hallow my name. So if the word, and I think you already see where I'm going, if the word should be suggested as perfection, well, God's, God is perfect. God is perfection, but we're not. So now, if you're going to make the stretch to show the word value Godward, that's one thing, but that value, when God declares an inanimate thing holy, that inanimate thing, the only way it will become unholy, profane, or unclean, or common, is God making the declaration in reverse. It was for a purpose, it was for a time, now it is not. But I have yet to find where, when God has declared a thing, the thing remains so. But as I've said of people, that is not so. And if it was said of people that we are holy in the sense that common modern Christianity has understood the word, then the word would have to, you, you can't have it both ways. You can't selectively decide how you're going to get to understand this word. You're either going to take it from the value as it appears using the antonyms, because that's going to be our easiest way, and looking at the verbal forms to see you, there's, there's no way that this application to perfect could be understood the way most modern Christians have taken it. Now, on the flip side, this is so much information that if I'm, I'm trying to review and I'm trying to keep everybody, there's so much information, believe me, when I say to you to try and sift this down to just about the most basic parts, and there's still so much more. But I, I referenced um, James Barr because James Barr was an incredible Semiticist and linguist. I mean, I don't think in our time we'll ever see somebody like James Barr. Um, and the legacy of his writing and his teaching lives on for people who are into language, specifically Semitic languages. How he, he took this word, and I've told you, great minds have just been tormented by this subject. As we will see, even within Christendom, the views of the Calvinists, the views of the Arminians, the views of the Quakers, the Roman Catholic view, each has its own understanding of how, how should we understand this word. And each carries with it a, a theological problem, which I don't want to even open, that's like a Pandora's box, because not everybody is up to understanding or at the point of knowing what is Calvinism and why the Calvinistic views of this subject, unfortunately, you end up with a concept or a doctrine or an ideology that if you take it to the nth degree, you can't get there from here. And you'll be right back where I started, which is saying, there are all those people out there that say, we've arrived. You haven't found the secret out yet. Well, maybe that's not true because it's not a secret. It's in God's book. We just have to look a little closer. The biggest, the biggest thing that I can tell you about this word is if we are working from the Hebrew, there are a few things we should note to self on. The first one is when we talk about the word, the setting apart of something. And even to define it properly is a problem, but the setting apart of something. When it says that God, he basically, he ordains this day as a day of rest. And he says, essentially, I'm declaring this holy. Now, I, I introduced this too uh, last week, both 
uh, here and on festival. How can something that is, that is inanimate become something other than? Now, this will open up an interesting discussion for those of you who will go in circles about this, because I have. It's been something that's gone in my mind over and over and over again. If God declared something to be holy, to be special, to be set apart, let's go to something different than a day. Let's take all of the utensils in the tabernacle. Now, well, we don't know where those utensils are, but that, didn't, that doesn't change the fact that when they were decreed or they were said to be holy because God said, my, my presence will be here, these will serve me, God, what you end up with are items that they don't have a free will, so they remain that way until they disappeared, wherever, wherever they went. And I know you've probably seen plenty of programs on TV that tell you about the, you know, all the stuff that's supposedly missing, that's hidden somewhere, that somebody stashed away. You know, it's always interesting the programs that come out with um, the discovery of the ark. I'm sure you've, you've seen some of those programs, you know, where they say they, they found the ark, right? <laughs> oh, and I guess we also maybe found Noah, too. <laughs> uh, not so much. But a lot of these programs, they, they get you all hyped up, right? <laughs> Somebody's got the ark, and they're guarding it. And then some guy comes out, and he's got a, goodness, how do I get this out of here? He's got something that looks like this. He says, it's the ark. Don't touch it, right? I'm guarding it. But let's just pretend for a minute that that was the ark and God said that was holy. Then the ark, that object, if it was authentically that object, would still be holy because it doesn't have the capacity, even if it falls into common hands, to become otherwise. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good, because I wasn't sure I said that right. All right. On the flip side, let's talk about the priests, because that there's the easier way to kind of start chipping away at this. The priests, specifically out of Leviticus, we've got a, a whole ritual designed to consecrate, to commit, to set apart these individuals for service to God. This is what's important, because if it, if it fits here, it's going to fit the same way all the way through the Bible. This is where we find out if we understand and if our doctrine actually is sound. These individuals whom God chose, he chose them. There wasn't anybody that stepped up that said, oh, I'd like to go and minister in the tabernacle because I think I'm qualified because nobody would be that stupid, right? Come on. If you're reading this book, why would you want to go in there? Why? <laughs> Going in there, you run the risk that you could die. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> Sounds like fun. So no fool would put their hat in the ring for that. By the way, you had to be part of a family and part of a line and part of a group of people that God said, those people will minister to me. Now, and let's turn there. Let's, let's see if we can get a little gleaning out of Leviticus, maybe after 17, here we go. So starting at 19, which is the header in my Bible says laws of holiness and justice. And if you keep going, you've got holiness of the priests. That's chapter 21. And then holiness of the offerings is chapter 22. Holiness of the priests. Chapter 21, the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto the priests, the sons of Aaron, say unto them, There shall none be defiled for the dead among his people, but for his kin that is near unto him, that is for his mother, his father, his son, for his daughter, for his brother, for his sister, a virgin, that is nigh unto him, which hath had no husband. For her may he be defiled. Now, Again, this is a clean versus unclean. 
but he shall not defile himself being a chief man among his people to profane himself. This is where I want you to see the use of the word, the words defiled and profane versus that which is holy. Now, a person could defile themselves very easily in the, in the law by coming in contact with a dead person. You could defile yourself that way. This is why, by the way, in modern jewelry, when they go to the um, cemetery, you'll always see those who practice, they'll wash their hands before they go into their house as a symbol of, of cleansing oneself, having come in contact. And there's also a prayer that you're supposed to recite, having come in contact with the dead. And some people come in contact with the dead more often than others. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Husbands and wives may understand that a little bit more. Never mind. All right. So I'm wanting you to focus on the words defile and profane along with the words holy because this is where we're starting to get an idea of the antonyms and the use of the word. Now take a look. I'm, going, I'm reading back again at verse 5. They shall not make baldness upon their head, Neither shall they shave off the corner of their beard, nor make any cuttings in their flesh. They shall be holy unto their God, and not profane the name of their God. You're just starting, I don't know if you've ever read it like this, to focus on the antonyms versus focusing on the holy. Once you do that, you're starting to get a little bit more of a sense of the word. They shall be holy unto their God, and not profane the name of of their God, for the offerings of the Lord made by fire and the bread of their God, they do offer, therefore they shall be holy. These, by the way, these two words in verse 6 for holy are, um, at least one of them I see is, is a noun. Um, they shall not take a wife, that is verse 7, that is a whore or profane. Neither shall they take a woman put away from her husband, so no divorced woman for he is holy unto his God. Thou shalt sanctify him therefore, for he offereth the bread of thy God. He shall be holy unto thee, for I, the Lord, which sanctify you, am holy. And there, remember I made mention of the piel being the verb that is most likely used where God is the subject. Here we have that example. And the daughter of any priest, if she profane herself by playing the whore. Now, strangely enough, folks, if you take a look at verse 9, it's the weirdest place for us to get clarity, but it's, it, that's where you get clarity. The daughter of any priest, if she profane herself by playing the whore, that is what was now becoming unclean. I don't want to use the word unholy, and stay with me. This is not something comedic but unclean, what has now become common or unclean. This is where I want you to look at the other side, which is holy. It's not perfect. That's the point I'm driving home today. I tried this last week, but I felt like, ah, it's frustration because there will be people who will say, but this must mean perfection. It can only mean perfection when it is speaking of God himself, not of the people whom he sanctifies because that suggests that we are able to no longer sin. First John says, if a person says they have no sin, they're a liar. Why? Because we all sin all the time, even after becoming or getting saved. So here is where this really kind of comes together. The daughter of any priest, if she profane herself by playing the whore, she profaneth her father. Now, this is a pretty hefty price. She shall be burnt with fire. Hmm, methinks I'm going to stay in tonight. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's one way to stay in God's good grace, I guess. And he that is the high priest among his brethren, upon whose head the anointing oil was poured, and that is consecrated to put on the garments, shall not uncover his head, nor rend his clothes, neither shall he go into any dead body, nor defile himself for his father, for his mother, Neither shall he go out of the sanctuary, nor profane the sanctuary of his God. Now, I'm going to ask you this, this question, because these two words, you cannot really see 
how they appear in Hebrew, but profane and sanctuary, because sanctuary is the same word for holy. In this case, not always, but in this case, you can see there is a word play in the Hebrew that you cannot even see in the English. And if you were reading it as a Hebrew reader or someone who reads Hebrew, you would see the two words. Oftentimes this happens with Hebrew. Sometimes it'll be like we've seen with the Psalms, where you have an acrostic. It's, it's, it's cryptic for the English reader because we can't see it. And the only time you will see that clearly revealed is Psalm 119, because if you, most Bibles have the Hebrew letters over them, and it is an acrostic as well. A lot of times these things, what I'm pointing out to you, if you were reading them in Hebrew, it would be like, wow, I see it. But here, it's kind of covered up because of the nature of how we've used the words and how they have come to kind of almost essentially have just such, such a, a non-meaning because we don't really have clarity on the terminology. Do you see why I said this is confusing? Yeah. And some of you are going, <laughs> yeah. All right, let's keep, keep reading. Neither shall he go out of the sanctuary nor profane the sanctuary of his God, for the crown of the anointing oil of his God is upon him. I am the Lord. He shall take a wife in her virginity, uh, a widow, or a divorced woman, or profane, or a harlot. These shall he not take, but he shall take a virgin of his own people to wife. Neither shall he profane his seed among his people, for I, the Lord, do sanctify him. So if you keep reading, you're, you're going to find certain things. For example, the bread, the showbread, is called the most holy. The showbread. And sometimes you've got to, is, was it called holy bread because it was perfect? Well, we got that recipe, right? <laughs> or was it called holy because it, Again, the simplicity, it belonged to the Lord. It was dedicated to the Lord. It was to the Lord, although, who ate the bread? So you tell me, this is why I said to you, that it's, it's picking the places where you can open up the words and it is indeed in looking at the opposites or the antonyms that we find. This one section, I, I ask you, if you do nothing else, when you go home, read Leviticus 21 and 22, because what they do in these two chapters, they give you um, the, the holiness of the priest, the holiness of the offerings, but you can start to see, if, especially if you're using the technique I just did, which is to go for the antonyms, the opposite, and see the meaning there is much clearer than to try and determine a one-fits-all, this means holiness. Now, if our understanding of this word can get a little clearer, which it will once we get into the Septuagint, which is the Greek of the Old Testament, if we can get a little clearer, once we move into the New Testament, we will be perfectly clear. There are elements here. I want you to think about the tabernacle. The tabernacle was, God just said, Moses, up in the mount, I want you to build this thing. And See, see to it that you build exactly the way I told you, to, according to the pattern. But the tabernacle wouldn't be what it was unless God's presence descended on it to be there. That essentially filling of the tabernacle with God's presence, with his Shekinah glory, is a connection with something that is an attribute of him he is, he does not have to say, hey, I'm going to tell you how I want you to think of me, but he says, I am, I am holy, fills the temple with his presence, and these two concepts of God's presence, which brings on a clarity about holiness or the set-apartness of the individual, will come all the way into the New Testament in a different way completely different way, and I'm doing this now so you can eventually see where I am going with this. My favorite passage in the Bible, John 15, right? 
And if my words abide in you and you abide in my words, in other words, the presence of God will remain. As long as you abide in my word, my word stays in you. You are meditating on my word. You're connected with my word. God's presence is there. And now, the difference between us and the tent of old is God no longer needs an individual tent or an individual tabernacle. Why? Because we have become the habitation of God. And with the habitation of God is his presence. And with his presence comes his holiness. Once we get that down right, people will stop saying crazy things like, well, I'm no saint. Oh, yes, you are. It's from the same group of words. You absolutely are. The minute that God called on you, the minute that God's word, his call, made you make an about face, at that moment, for you simply trusting God, you're a saint. You're a saint. That doesn't mean you're dead yet. <laughs> Sorry, Catholics. And as far as I'm concerned, if we can get this down, we can move through the bulk of these references with some really clear understanding. Now, this is a delightful thing. Let me tell you, there's, there's more to this. There's so many areas. I, I, sometimes I just kind of get overwhelmed. I just want to, I want to spend two hours dumping on you instead of one hour. <laughs> but why I want you to read the 22nd chapter of Leviticus is there's another reason there. That all has to do with the, it says, holiness of the offerings. Now, here's what's, there's just like little subtle nuances here. You know how you hear folks all the time talking about they went to church or they watched a program on TV and all the preacher did was talk about money and giving and money and giving and money and giving and money and giving, right? And, oh, I can't, I don't want to go to church because all they talk about is money and giving. But when you read the Bible, something really interesting, God talks a lot about giving. And he's the inventor. He's the one that said, this is how I want it done. Now, somebody will say, well, but these are offerings in the Old Testament. We don't offer like that anymore. You're right. We don't offer like that anymore. The difference between the old and the new is total dedication versus a little part, one animal, the spilling of blood, one moment in time versus a sacrifice that doesn't need to be made again and again and again, which is Christ. But the offerings, and this is where I will, not, I will not budge from this. I will not move. When God says something is important to him, he doesn't change. This is why I taught on this before. When God says about the Passover, it will be a memorial from generation to generation forever. Why did he say that? Because he had the capacity to say, now Christ has come. But Paul picked up the words in the New Testament, Christ our Passover, taking something that was in the old, which was simply a type or a shadow and making it the substance or the reality, applying it directly to Christ. So when we talk about, in this chapter 22, it'll talk about the offerings. I think it's really remarkable how people could read this book cover to cover and say, no. Nope, we don't do any more offerings. We don't give any more. No, we're not killing animals. We're not sacrificing anything. Neither do the Jews do that anymore because they don't have a place to do it. But what we do have is God never, sorry legalist, sorry perfectionist, sorry stupid people out there, <laughs> God never said you will no longer have to give. Paul, Romans 12, you are to Give yourself wholly, not in part, not a little bit, not a portion. Completely offer yourself as a living sacrifice. Now, the next person who says, well, that's the Old Testament. We don't, we don't, we don't. Hey, listen, there are 66 books, and this is what some people need to figure out. God does not need your money to be God. And the things that you have, your health, your money, your possessions, your family, whatever you have, you have it because God gave it to you. Whether you recognize him as the provider 
or you treat him as common and profane and say, God didn't do this thing. I get out there every day and I earn my pay every day because I go to work, because I have a job, because I'm smart. <sighs> I would say, take cover, folks, because eventually maybe you know, God's going to have enough of people saying this type of stuff, which is frequent. No, God gave you this ability. It, you know, in Deuteronomy, the people were kind of high-minded like that, and God said, through Moses, obviously, he says, don't say, my hand gave me the ability. You recognize God in all things. And at the crux of all of this, for the priests, for the offerings, straight through the book, there is something that is, without this, you've got people going through either motions to try and act or become but it is the presence of God. Remember I said, we'll see this all the way into the New Testament. It is the presence of God to Christ's disciples. Christ speaks to his disciples and he says, you are clean through the word. He doesn't say go wash. He doesn't say go sprinkle, go dunk. He says, you're clean through the word. And that word abiding is essentially the written word of the living word abiding in us. That's God's presence with us. So what I hope that you take away today, because it's, it's laying down layers. Maybe it's the thing that we have canceled out, not maybe what we have added, but what we've canceled out, that this, this concept cannot mean, it cannot mean perfection. It cannot mean sinlessness unless you are talking about God himself, an attribute of God, God's activity, God's work that he does and brings down to humankind. Otherwise, you've just got a bunch of people who like to dress up in long flowing robes, who can genuflex, cross their hands, cross anything else that they can. And it's the act, which is nothing more than works of the flesh. Now, if you're interested in God doing a work in you versus you trying to do it for God, then you're going to want to listen to what I have to say because, yes, it's, it is, all of this is an act of faith that you, you and I operate on, under the guise, under the realm that this, this word is God's word and God is declared. But here I find if we clear away all the garbage and all the baggage and all the stuff that people bring with them, and are just looking for the essence, I've already found it in Leviticus. I've already uncovered what it does not mean. Now, last week, I think either here in the service or on festival, I covered this. The sons of Aaron, and then I'm done for today. The sons of Aaron. Were they not chosen by God? Were they anointed? Were they separated out to do the work of the ministry in the tent? Yes, did they bleep up? Yes, and they just didn't do a little bleep up. It was a pretty big one. God said that fire, they used false fire. And if you go back a little bit, you'll read how God also said, when you go in to serve, no hooch for you. And apparently these two probably, they found something to indulge in and went inside the tent probably like two crazy kids. They probably could have set the whole thing on fire. Uh, but God said that's not the way it's going to happen, and boom, Nadab and Abihu, are, they're done. God wipes them out. Now, if, if the concept of holiness was to keep you from sinning and you'll never sin again, then how did that happen? Which is why that can't mean that. Let's eliminate that. Let's push that to the side. Now, there are other terms that we will have to look at, other antonyms, other words that will be useful in the building up process. The one thing I can tell you, though, is when you and I have at least gone through, I'm going to say, a, the bulk of the, the references in the Old Testament, and I would say definitively, once we finish off, Malachi is probably the best place to look because it was the priests there set apart men for God's sake offering up faulty offerings, bad offerings that God said are not acceptable to me. 
but these are set apart people. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Because that, that has to be there for us to keep building on this foundation. Otherwise, we're going to keep having an error and thinking, well, the priests, they're holy and they never make mistakes and they don't sin because they do. And we're sinners all the time. We're sinners being saved by grace. We're sinners who know we need a savior. But no perfection, not in this lifetime. So what I would hope to, to uh, leave you with, that you leave here today with, is maybe what we have done in reverse. The thing that for using the word holy or sanctify to set apart versus that which has become common. And again, the showbread versus any other bread. There's a good case in point for you. The showbread, that's for God's purpose to God, an offering from the people to God, and yet the priests partook of it. And only certain people could partake of it. It is therefore set apart in a certain way. But it doesn't suggest, by the way, if you, if you say, well, all bread is alike, because this is bread and that's bread, so it's all bread. No, it's not. This is bread that God said, it's mine. This bread over here, who knows what it is? So once we get to see, this is common bread over here. You can go to the grocery store and buy this bread all day long. But this bread over here, this is a different type of bread. That may have the same ingredients, by the way. But it's a different type of bread. Why? Because God declared it to me. End of story. Now, I can't, I wish I could just rush this along and tell you, hey, in 30 minutes, I have solved the world's problems. We have, we have figured out how to unravel uh, a couple hundred years of, of uh, understanding or misunderstanding. But I can tell you this, maybe over the course of the next couple of weeks, we'll come to some great clarity on the subject and we'll be able to say, if nothing else, we have debunked what this is not. And it is not some elitist group that you know these people do and these people don't. God a receiver here? able and have the desire to, to listen. And I'm not saying listen to me because I'm the only one. I'm saying anyone who has a desire to listen to the Bible being taught and opened up, God is saying, I'm, I'm working on you. Because no, I don't, I've, I've not known any person in the natural that's able to say, oh yeah, I want to hear about this thing. Otherwise you say, God, this is, this is like torment. I'm, I'm tortured trying to find the meaning of these words. Sometimes I, that's how I feel sometimes. I'm going through dictionaries and I've got books stacked up everywhere and I'm thinking, are you kidding me? Like how many hundreds of people did this before me and came to the place of going, oh, <laughs> they locked him away, right? <laughs> so I don't want to become that person. So we'll just do it in steps, nice and slowly, right? And I think we'll make it together and we'll have some good clarity. So stay with me, folks. I'll see you next Sunday. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.